Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to our uh, summer edition of The New Normal. We're doing it on a different day. Um, we're doing it on a Thursday because uh, we've got uh, some summer Fridays coming up and we know that a lot of people, um, even if they don't have anywhere to go, uh, kind of uh, fade away on Fridays. So we're trying something new also this month where we're looking ahead to what comes out of this, uh, these overlapping crises in, in various industries. So talked with Michelle Lee last week about um, the beauty industry. And this week, I'm gonna have in uh, Joe Manoff, who is the editor-in-chief of Glossy, which is Digital Media's publication brand that is focused on uh, the future of fashion and beauty. So thank you, Jill. But before I bring in Jill, I'm gonna do my, uh, my best sales pitch. Um, and you know, the best sales pitches are ones that you, you actually believe in and I actually believe in this. Um, and that's Digiday Plus. Uh, Digiday Plus is our membership program. Um, this is core to uh, what we do and it enables all the journalism that we do do. Um, and you get unlimited access to all of our stories. You get exclusive content. We have, we have member briefings, and newsletters, and, Lara O'Reilly, for instance, had a fantastic um, uh, briefing this week. Um, we do uh, original uh, research. Uh, we have a panel of like 5,000, I believe, um, industry executives in which we poll them regularly on hot button issues. Um, and we do exclusive events for, for members and, and reports on the future of digital identity and various other topics. Um, and eventually, when we can get uh, Digiday Magazine to you, we will, we will get it to you. Uh, so anyway, if you want to join, if you're not already a member, please do try it out. Um, and to do so, I want to uh, offer you a little bit of a discount if you use TNN. Um, so just go to digiday.com slash subscribe, um, and, and please do try it out. I promise you'll like it. All right. I want to bring in Jill Manoff. Jill, we talk every day, but now we're going to be talking with other people around. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That is a fashionable okay. shirt you've got there. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I had a. My wife told me I had a change out of uh, the T-shirt that I had on uh, during our editorial meeting today. But you, we, you, you joined us back in November 2016. Glossy was just uh, just getting started, um, and you've done an amazing job um, leading it. So thank you for for that. Oh, um, you. You've got a, a long background in in the fashion industry. Now, Glossy covers fashion and beauty, but I want to zero in on fashion uh, today. In all of these conversations that, that I have, and they're usually about the media industry, but you know, I'd like to delve into other industries too. Um, and we talk all the time about acceleration and it's almost become a cliche, but you know, it's a cliche for a reason. What kind of, what trends are accelerating right now in the fashion business because of um, coronavirus and the other crises, the economic crises, the social crises? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, obviously high level, but uh, e-commerce, it's more apparent on the fashion side than in beauty, than in any other industry, just because uh, f luxury fashion brands especially have long ignored it. Some of them still don't have e-commerce sites, which is bananas. I mean, maybe they'll They'll offer uh, a small selection of accessories, but they don't offer their full assortment. Um, and they're missing out on sales, especially now. Like they don't have a store. They do Stores are closed, let's say. And the only way that they're able to sell anything, nothing's direct. They're, people are buying uh, resale, their items on resale because that's the only place that it's accessible right now. Um, I'm, I'm just calling out Chanel. Fashion File has told me that before. So um, yeah. Acceleration of e-commerce, acceleration of the shift to digital, um, the reliance on physical retail. This is so top of mind for me right now. If you are a Glossy Plus member, you should read my briefing today because it just really highlights the fallout of some of these brands, Ralph Lauren, um, Michael Kors, that reported earnings this week and way down, they rely heavily on wholesale and those wholesale uh, sales for the quarter down 90 plus percent for uh, for Ralph Lauren um, wholesale for Michael Kors in the 80s. So 
um, it's just showing, wow, that's a no-no. They're moving away from it, but it's a little like too slow, too little, too late. Um, even pulling out of stores now, they're 200 at a time, 5% of their sales. It's just a slow move and they don't have that, you know, they're not nimble. They, they're not able to make these quick transitions and it's, that's what's going to hurt them. That's what's going to bite them in the ass. It might be their downfall. It, it'll likely be the downfall for many <laughs> for sure. So e-commerce is the big one. Um, and okay. we can get into other yeah, nitty gritty details. Okay. So the big one is, and it's, it's funny to be talking about like, you know, the shift to e-commerce as like a acceleration, but I think it's important to remember that particularly for a lot of these high-end fashion brands, you know, e-commerce for so many years was, was something, you know, at first they ignored and, and then it was something that they kind of only did on the side, really. Right. I mean, like, it wasn't like like something that was core to because of the, the, the high end fashion experience. Right. Yes. And it was all about maintaining that exclusivity. If they put a a website out there, anybody can have access. You don't have to come to our store. It, It was like, um, click here for to be quoted a price like you couldn't even shop immediately you had to work with one of their direct salespeople so that they could offer the the brand experience they you'll get the full experience nobody wants to deal with some somebody, somebody while you're shopping on e-commerce at late at night so anyway you're missing out on sales it's a big mistake night, yeah. <laughs> um, okay let's talk about uh that's a that's a good like start but let's talk about winners and losers i'm always interested in winners and losers and I know like we've had editorial meetings where it's like, oh, it's too crass to say winners. But these things, there's always winners that come out of, um, out of these crises, right? And, and usually the, um, the seeds of that success are planted well before. Um, and sometimes the external environment changes, you know, quite a bit. Um, there's, um, there's nothing you can do if you're, um, uh, if you're, uh, like a, a swimsuit brand, the fact that people are not going anywhere and probably buying fewer swimsuits. But give me, give me, um, we'll start with just give me one winner and then we'll switch to a loser and then we'll go winner and loser. So give me a winner. It can be a company, it can be a trend, it can be, I'll leave it to you, Jill. Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about what is fashion and what is not fashion because we cover like underwear and we cover, um, you know, this and that. But one obviously is uh, athletic apparel, the Nikes, the Lululemons, their sales are way up because yeah anything that will get you outdoors and get you active and outside of the house a uh, big winner for sure okay but what is that like was that obviously were you know sweatpants were um you know de rigueur for a long time it's now it's now warmer i'm in miami it's really hot it's too hot for sweatpants i gotta be honest with you um but what is is, is that speaking to something that emerges out of this or is that just a temporary as we're stuck inside? I mean, active wear was yeah. doing well I, anyway, right? Yeah, it's yeah, I wouldn't say it's um, I would say it's time, it's specific to the times. Um, honestly, I was wondering when I was thinking about winners and losers, if this is going to continue on. Uh, like what happens in the winter? Like, do you really care if you're working out indoors, if you're if anybody sees you wearing the same sports bra. <laughs> anyway, where you know what I mean. I don't care when I'm at home what I look like when I work out. So it's like when you're out and about, when you're at, you get to go to the park. When it's spring summer months, obviously it's gonna it's gonna spike. You, you're gonna care more. Um, so yeah, will this hold on? TBD. But yes, athletic apparel. I mean, there are innovations left and right on with sports bras and improvements and leggings are still the rage. It, it was already hot, but yeah, definitely if looking at what people are buying they're buying that more than anything else so i would call that a winner okay uh how about a loser now let's go with the losers a loser There's a lot to choose from. i mean this this is the time of losers let's be honest with you so losing has to be like relative to the field yes i would say um the um indoor malls of the world are a big <laughs> <laughs> loser yes Yes, you can't, like, they're so close to New York City. Hudson Yards is not open, (laughs) Uh, obviously. So, I mean, there's a ripple effect. Uh, Brands that set up shop 
in malls are feeling it hard. Um, and yeah, they're, they're looking to gather their leases. Um, Neiman Marcus skedaddled out of uh, Hudson Yards. So anyway, the enclosed malls, the department stores, which we can dig deeper into because um, yeah, the whole department store model has so many issues right now that are all tied up into supply chain and inventory and it's just really going against brands direction. Again, this is top of mind for me right now based on the recent earnings, but every brand that I talked that that spoke um, said that they want to move to um, full price. They're actively, they're increasing their prices, which department stores, um, two thirds of their inventory right now, um, as of June, sale merchandise. So it like, it just goes against why people go to the department store. They go there, um, they're looking for deals. They have a coupon. It's friends and family. It's three day sale at Macy's, whatever. Um, so they, they trade in these, in these great sales and yes, full price. Um, they're moving away from discounts. They are, they want to do less inventory. They want to sell out of what they, what they send to retailers. Um, so yes. Yeah. But I mean, they're sitting on a ton of inventory right? Aren't they like, isn't there a ton of inventory? I mean, even with the disruption of, of, of manufacturing, I mean, you know, demand had a plummet. Um, yes. They're all but I, I guess what I'm interested with the department stores, we've seen a lot of department stores um, uh, filing for bankruptcy protection. It's like every, every week, it seems like it's like, oh, wait, I'm kind of reminded of, you know, there's like old celebrities who I don't know if you are like, but I'm like, I thought they were, I thought they were already dead. Um, kind of thing I kind of feel that way sometimes when like a department store fire files for bankruptcy where I'm like I thought they were already bankrupt um, I don't know if that's not yes like Berger Goodman somebody just said that in our group this week like wait did they close no they're still around but yeah are they bankrupt yet but I, I mean obviously there's an acute issue right now with these department stores but is yeah. some of this Corona cover, we talk about Corona cover for a lot of things. And there's a lot of weaknesses in sectors, in industries and in companies, frankly, um, that the Corona cover is being used. And it's like every, everyone, you know, I like, like Quibi, you know, in a different conversation with Tim Peterson, it's like, you know, Quibi's blaming coronavirus for like their ham-handed launch. And it's like, no, I don't think so. I think it was just like, kind of like not a great idea, like not well executed and you have no must watch hits. Yep. Department stores, the writing was already on the wall, wasn't it? Totally. You people used to, it used to be the go-to when you, maybe you know a brand and you're going to pick up a pair of pants. Like it was a place for discovery. Like people are on Instagram, people are going online. You're not going to the department store to find out what's next in fashion. Like that's old news. Like even their system of getting the, the inventory, like we've seen it, we know it, it's old news. Like if we wanted it, we would have ordered it weeks ago. Um, so a place for discovery, um, a place for, again, convenience, because they had the racks of every size imaginable, this overabundance of inventory. So if you want to go, anyway, those were the two reasons, discovery, yeah. convenience, and that's all out the door, especially. But let's go to a winner then. I mean, this, I'll give you I, what I think might be a yes. winner, is Instagram. Yes. I, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm alone. Like, I criticize Facebook. Facebook a lot. I click on an Instagram ad every day, every day. Yes. And like, I, and and to discover, okay, there's a lot of like Sky Mall products on Instagram, but like to discover new brands on uh, a platform, I, I I think it's like a, I think it's amazingly effective. I mean, maybe I'm in like really great categories. Usually, it's about mail order meat. And then like <laughs> some sneakers and <laughs> now like swimsuits, but like um, my talk awesome. to me about like Instagram has to be a winner out of all of this, right? As a shopping yeah. destination. Yeah, we've talked about it in our editor meeting about how it's the go-to for everything. It's the, the go-to to find out if our if your local store is open. It has the hours stated on Instagram. It's the go-to for everything. I would not like to toot my own horn, but like I called this as like a main shopping destination for direct to consumer brands um, as like the mall for direct to consumer brands. You're not maybe, you don't want to go seek out a direct to consumer site and like, because you know, maybe you like the brand, you're going to find it on Instagram 
I think it's, I think it's getting better in terms of personalization. Recently, I've been served again all mine fashion that's being served up to me. Um, but yes, I've been hitting follow on all these brands that I never heard of that are sponsored because I'm like that's I love mm-hmm. this like that's my style. The the personalization is great. So let's talk about those brands because um, you know we have modern retail uh, as one of our other brands too. So we we are deep into this DTC space. There are thousands of this. I think. I think like I I, I think I think uh, there's probably like a hundred DTC swimwear brands. I think there are. Um, is my fave. Uh, is, fave brand. Go ahead. Is are DTC fashion brands a winner or loser right now because of this? Um, and I know it varies, but like we got to do this for the show. Um, are, are they mostly a winner or a loser? Are we seeing like the sort of long predicted shakeout um, as funding gets tighter and okay. and the need to turn a profit is is it is great at a time when it's really difficult to turn a profit. Exactly. They all relied on like the revenue numbers and they love to share those revenue numbers. It's going to be a, a shakeout. Like I, I just talked with um, my, my name twin, Jill Granoff from um, Eurasio Brands. And she was like, she was saying, you know, they had formerly invested in Pat, like this is beauty, but like Pat McGrath's brand. Um, and she's like, she's got this amazing community and that was working. Anyway, she just said, basically, we don't want to invest in anything that's not a necessity. We want, to, I'm looking at um, mental health apps. I'm looking at grocery. I'm looking at, um, anyway, it was nothing, no fashion, no beauty. They've done that and they're moving on. And that's just what's going to happen across the board, no doubt. And so, yes, the brands have heavily relied on that funding. Um, and yeah, they're going to be scrambling. They're okay. Gonna be <laughs> Okay, let's talk about another um, loser, I guess, right now, but I want to like think about it like going forward and that's like fashion week. Like, um, you know, you are a founder of the St. Louis Fashion Week. I, I'm tooting your horn now, Jill, is this correct? Indeed. Pierre had me these notes in your bio and it says founder of uh, St. Louis Fashion Week. It was good, man. <laughs> You're out of your time. But anyway, there's a ton of fashion weeks. And explain for those who aren't, um, you know, knee deep in this stuff, the role that fashion week has played in this industry up until now. Up until now. Evolution, evolution, evolution. We all know that it started as a place for buyers to go, view the collections, place the orders on the spot. That's the whole, the whole intention of it. It has evolved where it is a marketing opportunity. They invite the celeb- the designers invite the celebrities. Everybody's increasingly sharing it on social media. Um, yes, marketing opportunity. Okay, so it was like a marketplace model because I'm trying to like I always try to I always try to make comparisons to the media industry, and it sounds like you know the upfronts for the TV industry have been this, you know, storied institution that everyone says is backward and shouldn't really be the way things are done in a modern um, industry. But at the same time, it kind of works and there's a lot of entrenched interests and blah, 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 blah. It seems like Fashion Week's kind of the similar thing. Like it started in a different era and it has continued because it has continued and there's a bunch of people who have interests in it continuing. Is that fair? It's fair, yeah. And it's almost like, I don't know, like, look at me. It, it's, it's like showboating for these You gotta brands. go to Milan, you gotta go to Paris. This sounds horrific, like, you know. And every season. Really, um, <laughs> it's expensive. It's every season. It's forcing these brands that don't want to be left out of the conversation when the conversation's hot during fashion to come, turn out these, I mean, there's a whole ripple effect again, but to turn out these collections at least four times a year, which you know, the big ones have since, we're doing two now. Michael Kors just said that. So it's just like, it was too much. Nobody even knows there's a pre-fall week. A lot of people, if you're not in the industry, nobody knows that there's a resort week. A lot of people, if you're not in the industry, it's like you're doing this for a handful of industry folks that are paying attention. And maybe you get those, I don't know, Instagram photos, but there are cheaper, more affordable ways to get beautiful Instagram photos for sure. Yeah. So now many of these, but not all of them, have to be moving into virtual, right? Yes, 
we just saw that with uh, Paris and Milan with the men's weeks. I keep saying like, again, if you were not in the industry, you did not know this was happening. Um, and there was a range, like some of them were creative. Um, I think it was Lueve or Jonathan Anderson, like made it very um, interactive where they sent a box to the, the editors and the viewers ahead of time with like a lookbook and a, um, a little piece from like samples. Anyway, it was like very um, much like, this is what you're going to be in for. It was like a preview to what you were in for. And then you got to it and it was like, I mean, it was a show. It was a beautiful video. There were a lot of um, videos that were much like a campaign video that Gucci does every season. So it's like, okay, that's it. Like, okay. It was a lot of, I viewed the videos because I did a story about it. It seemed like a lot of almost just, it distract. You want to um, set the tone. You want to say, this is our brand story for the season. You don't see a lot of clothes. You just see a lot of, uh, I don't know, well, trees. I mean, it, it's a production, right? So, I mean, if like, isn't it, it's, it's sort of like the, look, fashion, I think is, is incredibly interesting as uh, in, in that it's, it's a form of art, right? That like meets commerce and like, but art is, is at the center of it. So, I mean, I always understood that if Gucci and Alessandro and Michele is, is going to do, he's going to like take over some like 14th century uh, church and like put on a rave or something, whatever, like, <laughs> like the clothes are there, right? <laughs> it seems like quite a way to go to show off like, you know, a bunch of outfits. Right. Well, I am a Fashion Week fan. And so I just, I just wanted to see, you know, the outfits, what, what are they showing? Show me the outfit, like front and center. I want to see the whole thing. And it was like, it wasn't a replacement for the runway. I, I, I have no idea what they're showing this season. It was just like, look at beautiful. We're a distraction from yeah. your work from home. Okay, so most of these fashion, is New York Fashion Week off yet? It's a three-day event. I talked to, uh, probably hope I'm not revealing insider info, but I talked to somebody at IMG who does the, um, IRL, I guess, um, portion of Fashion Week, um, where they, I was told, you know, they're talking to the government and they're finding out what's allowed and what they're able to do. And she was asking me if we have, if we have a show and we could space them out very far, far apart, the shows, we allow for more cleaning, we allow, um, maybe we have multiple shows for one designer so that we can, you know, have this many people at one, have this people at many people view another. Um, will you come? You know. And what did you say? <laughs> I was going to say, and you know. Um, I mean, if it's like the Jacquemus show or whatever the hell it's called that happened in Paris and where it's outside and there are, I don't know, six feet of corn stalks between me and the next guy, yeah. <laughs> like, I will go to that yeah. show. You, like, well, okay. you can go to the show, but you're not allowed to come back into the country. <laughs> that would be a problem. So you might have to be in Paris for a little while. That would be terrible. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think it'll be interesting, though, to see what comes out of this, right? So, I mean, look, in a very smaller way, we're seeing this on the event side, right? I mean, we've, we're not doing in-person events, obviously. We're doing these the digital, virtual versions of it. You know, the question is, when we come out of this, um, which we eventually will, um, what is the blend end up being? Do, do in-person events, um, you know, in our own industry change? to have a, a big virtual component, but then there's still a smaller in-person component or maybe just springs back to normal. Do you have any sense of like whether, are we just gonna snap back? Is the industry just gonna snap back to normal when it comes to Fashion Week and the role it plays? Yeah, I think there'll, there'll be a, a phase, yeah, an, an in-between phase for a while. I've been hearing from uh, designers that they wanna do something um, again, live in real life, and they want to also um, incorporate. They they want to make a video out of it. They want to be, um, which you know, designers have been doing that for a while. They've been playing live shows. Um, also, been hearing from uh, my friend Michael Crooks, who worked at Gucci and worked at um, Diane von Furstenberg. He's like, um, I, he sees it going uh, virtual, which uh, all video, which is interesting, but he's like, it's not going to work unless it's interactive. Um, if it's like, what is it called? Black mirror, whatever's on net Netflix, where you actually have the, yeah, the person, <laughs> the viewer gets immersed and they're part of the next move. And he's working on that and pitching it to some brands, um, right now, which is, um, 
I don't know, mm-hmm. getting involved in these virtual videos. But, um, and I've seen some interesting things like that where it's, if it's interactive, you do pay attention. A fast fashion brand, Fashion Nova did this with like, it was like who wore it best, but they were rolling out their new collection. They were showing two looks and it was just fun. And you do pay attention to the clothes. And it, when it's interactive, I think that that works. But I do think, anyway, I don't think it's gonna go there just yet. People love it. People mm-hmm. say they need it. Lisa Aiken from Moda Operandi, who is their uh, buying director, was like, uh, the fashion industry yeah. doesn't operate without it. It's too soon. We're not going to snap our fingers like that. Yeah. I mean, it, like, that's why it reminds me of the upfronts. For all that people complain about it and say it's an anachronism, like it serves its purpose. And, it, it, and, and that's why it keeps, until it stops serving that purpose, it's going to continue on. There's a lot of people, yes, with entrenched interests for it to keep being a centerpiece of how uh, TV is bought and sold. But as long as that marketplace dynamic is dependent on these fashion links, it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue, maybe, maybe in a changed form. Um, so one of the other things that w- we always talked about, like um, Glossier, while well, I listened in, um, was you know, this shift to, to I'm going to use air quotes, sustainability and like you know, the tension with fast fashion. Obviously, fast fashion. Um, had a fast rise, um, H&M and, and, and the others. Um, but then it seemed like there was this countervailing force around sustainability and being more, more mindful of the environment and, and thinking about um, the impact that your fashion choices have on you know, the greater world. Um, things have changed right now because like, you know, nobody's talking necessarily about, and what I'm interested in is we're in we're in for a long economic um, uh, decline right now for uh, for a bunch of different reasons. Are we going to see fast fashion just snapping back to and this sustainability stuff sort of fading into the background? Well, I did this story about like the end of fashion, or um, which it was about really about the end of trends, and that's what fast fashion thrives on. It typically, you know, came from the runway. They would scoop up an idea. This is the hot trend. Create a bunch of crap <laughs> and send it out there. Um, I talked to a Pretty Little Thing last week, which is a UK-based fast fashion retailer. They're seeing great sales. <laughs> they pivoted to comfort, comfortable clothes, track suits. I mean, like sweatsuits as opposed to like little sexy dresses. So, um, yes, it's a move <laughs> from. <laughs> I think sustainability is actually. I don't think that it's dead just because like it's so uncertain right now that there is a shift in what people are buying to kind of more classics and things that you're going to wear this season and next season, regardless of what happens in the next couple months, because we don't know what's going to happen. So nobody's buying something that's specific to a moment because we don't know. So those classics are taking off that Misha no news of the world. Um, her yes, white blouses, People, if they need something, they're going to buy something that they're going to wear forever is what I'm hearing. But I'm also hearing. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, this uh, this is a little Tom Friedman, but like I, when I was in New York before moving, like there was this giant line outside of Zara. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Because I think there's always this assumption and, you know, it's almost a hopeful assumption during these periods of great dislocation that something, something better will emerge. Right. I mean, it's natural for us as humans to think, you know, during the uh, there's a lot of loss and and destruction going on right now. And like you have to end up thinking, well, things are going to come on, come out better somehow, some way on the other side. And in some cases that will probably be true. In some cases, it might not be true. Um, And I wonder whether or not the, the sustainability stuff, which I've always viewed a little bit skeptically because it's seems to me a lot about marketing rather yeah, than say whether that stuff just like fades in the background. Yeah. I mean, we were looking at really digging into at the in March, April, May, like as everyone's making cuts, like what I you would think that they their sustainability um, I guess expert in house folks would be be first to go because that's like an extra, it's not our survival mode tool. But um anyway, we didn't see that just yet. I'm sure it's happening. Okay. You're saying I want to encourage people if you want to use the Q and A function, please do like jump in um, and and 
ask your questions uh, for Jill. We got our, our expert here. Um, the other one is like the industry fallout. I want to talk about that. And, you know, we're seeing this across all industries. Um, you know, in the media industry, we're seeing worker revolts. Um, and, you know, we started seeing this within the sort of like broader, um, you know, fashion, I think is an interesting, is an interesting one because it's a little bit like media in that like it, it, um, it's a sexy industry, so it, it attracts people. I, I always go back to Freakonomics and, and the, um, I don't know if you ever read Freakonomics, but like the, the they had one in there, why, why do what drug dealers still live with their parents? Um, and the reason was because like, you know, people are attracted to drug dealing for like the, the opportunity to like, you know, rise and be like one of the few winners and then your life is really good. But most people, like it's a terrible job. You, you don't make a lot of money, you can get arrested, you can shot and like stuff like this but media and fashion are not as dangerous but they are those kind of industries that attract a lot of people and and it's leverage and it's used by companies against uh the employees we're seeing this we've seen this in media and i'm yeah. sure you're seeing it in fashion i tell you what yeah i don't want to talk about myself too much but when i first wanted to work in fashion and i was in st louis i maybe wrote freelance stories on the side of my free Was this sears app. This was, no, this was a live magazine, a luxury lifestyle publication in the area. And I, I just was like, I want to write for them. I wrote stories. They had no money. They were new, 25 bucks a pop. And it, I would literally spend hours on them because I was like, I want to work in fashion. Anyway, it's just like, that's what it is. Like girls, you hear about the, the accessories closets, girls spending the whole day at Vogue, like organizing a closet and they're not getting paid. Like, why do they want to do that? Because they want to say, I work in the industry. I think that that like glossy glamour of it all is a little, it's going away because, um, you know, there's not that insider access that there once was. Like it's becoming more inclusive and everybody has access to the shows and everybody has access to behind the scenes. And um, I heard from some designers regarding fashion week that like they were debating, should I have something that's exclusive to the industry, to editors, um, ahead of time so that they, maybe they can tease it and they can put it out there and stir up some excitement before we roll it out to everybody. But like, really, if they put it out as a tease, of course, if it's hot and exciting, like it's going to sweep the nation anyway, like you can't control it. So once it's out on social media, it's out. Um, yes. Anyway, that, that inclusivity is kind of dwindling. New York, we were talking about is New York still a fashion capital when everybody that we're talking to says we're telling our people they can work wherever they want. Um, and they can come in for events, they can come in for shows. So, you know, it's not what it was. It's fizzled as this like New York central sexy yeah. hub. But I mean, fashion is still going to fashion. be a magnet industry. It's just too, there's too many people out there who are too into the, the, the clothing and, and everything around it. The, you know, I, I think it'll lose some of its glamour in some ways. I mean, you know, they're after, I don't know, Adam Wintour is like, you know, rain has been predicted to end uh, by the New York Times now, I think like eight or 10 times. Um, Still <laughs> there. Still has that. But hair. I don't think, so, you know, that, you know, she's a product of an era and I don't think that necessarily returns, but um, I think the, the industry will continue to be, um, you know, glamorous, sexy. Yes, I don't want to be a naysayer because I definitely like, you know, I agree. I When we were coming into this conversation and when I was writing that story about the move to comfort apparel and classic apparel, it was like, okay, yeah, but like also fashion is, a, is about self-expression. And yeah. of course, like you're, 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 you want to make a statement. Like you want to wear something that's not sweatpants because... Anyway, it's self-expression. It's not going anywhere. You're going to have a, a great accessory that maybe you can <laughs> throw on over you, a hot blazer over your, your sweatshirt, whatever. But anyway, it's, it's not going anywhere for sure. So let's talk about like the fashion industry in, in recession. I mean, who, like I was talking to Michelle Lee last week about like beauty and like, you know, Leonard Lauder had this like lipstick index, you know, and basically it was during a recession, lipstick typically does really well, though this is a little bit different because of the mask situation. Um, how, how do you see like a prolonged economic downturn 
affecting consumer choices. They're gonna, people are gonna have less money, although rich people are still gonna be rich. I hate to say, I mean, they are. Um, so explain to me, like, what are we gonna see more of like a, a bifurcation of the industry of, you know, the sort of, you know, the, the Gucci's up here and then the sort of, you know, fast fashion basics down here. Like, what, are, what do you see happening in a downturn? Yeah, we, we've talked about it. Danny has talked about it a lot, uh, Danny on my team and his stories about, yeah, the rich people are still buying things. They're buying a little bit differently. They're buying, um, th again, not, nothing trend driven. Maybe it's a fa fine jewelry piece that can become an heirloom, which is like, it'll never go out of style. They'll wear it forever. And for whatever reason, there is data to back it up, fine jewelry is selling. So, um, and also maybe they're not buying the new Birkin bag, but they're going to rebag and they're buying because it, it holds its value and it, it, it'll be, yes, they can sell it later if they want. So it's like smarter investments. They're, they're looking at the resale value. Um, they're looking at, I mean, more so than like cost per wear that like everybody else thinks about in, in fashion. Um, gosh, on the lower end, I would say, Hmm. I mean, it's, I feel like this is something that we've never experienced in, before, because, just because it's not that only that you're like pinching pennies because it's, you don't have them, but you're also not going anywhere. And I mean, that's temporary or we don't know when, but like, really, like, there's no excuse to shop. Like, you don't need anything. So. Yeah, there's the sort of shopping therapy kind of thing. Uh, escapism. I mean, shop, look, shopping and it is is a form of escapism just as much as watching Netflix is. Um, so there's, you know, there's that argument, but you just, there's simple economics, like, you know, as people have less income, they're going to cut back on, on certain expenses. And, you know, I guess travel is one expense that's already gone, but like, um, I, it has to impact, you know, the fashion industry. Yes, there's particular issues right now, but I, I would have to think it, it, it impacts it. Outside of the super high end, I, I, think, I think the interesting thing on the super high end is the unknown about the Chinese consumer, right? Yes. Um, I think one of, the, one of the reasons that fashion is so interesting as an industry and as a real serious business is how globalized it, it has become, more globalized than, than many other industries. Um, and it seems like on the high end, a lot of the growth has been powered by the Chinese consumer. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Liz on our team who has a lot of experience with the Chinese market, immediately when I just skimmed the, the Capri Holdings earnings, I was like, accessories are selling? And I was like, really? And like, cause on the list index that just came out and it was talking about what's hot and what's not, like the number one thing was like a pair of Birkenstocks and it was not like, um, <laughs> luxury accessories but anyway she's like it's probably the chinese consumer and it, it, it is it's like overwhelmingly um it's coming back revenge shopping and all of that but um it's seeing great growth more so than anyone is predicting for the u.s like ours is supposed to be maybe um down 40 percent for the whole year whereas right now it's down 66 percent. i mean it'll be slow right but i mean i think one of the issues it is with travel being down so much. I mean, if you go to Rue yeah. saint Honoré in, in Paris, you know, there's there's Chinese tour buses that are just dumping off like, you know, dozens of tourists that are that are going mobbing into stores. I mean, they have to have sort of restrictions in, in, in place and stuff like this in, in, in a lot of these stores. So that is really having, that, and that has to have an impact. Totally. I, I've heard that from people um, like Florida Mall found, um, founder about in Soho, like they're used to having um, those um, tourists from all over international. Uh, that's what that's what keeps their business in Soho running. Um, I've yeah. also, yeah, like the, the founder of Conservatory in Hudson Yards, he was saying uh, when they were open, like they had this prime location in right where you walked into Hudson Yards. And they have like, I don't know, it's a very concept store. They have um, it's a, an awesome curation. He's like, people take things from our store like a souvenir. We thrive on tourists as well. So, um, yes. So, so let's talk a little bit about um, this, the future of the storefront when it comes to fashion brands. I mean, um, obviously, you know, real estate is getting hit a lot. We're seeing a lot of store closures. People are shrinking their footprint. 
Um, one, I mean, is this just a temporary pullback or is this going to accelerate a rethinking of what the, the, the storefront um, represents for, for these brands? Yeah, speaking of uh, conservatory, something that he told me also, it's going to be, I agree, like you, it needs to be enough of an experience if you're not going like a Nordstrom local where it's like, it's about fulfillment, it's about convenience, it's something small and it's about in and out, or it needs to be enough of an experience where you're like, it's not like the museum of ice cream, but like, it's like where you want to buy something to remember this experience, like a souvenir. Like it's almost, I, I feel like it's one or the other. It's just like a store to have a store. Mm -hmm. No, especially in the capitals, like, New York where it's so expensive, uh, some brands are telling me they're taking that money, they want to spread it out and open a store in Atlanta and open a store in Nashville and get more bang for their buck in different markets. Um, so anyway, not worth it on Fifth Avenue right now. And yes, if it's not convenience, if it's not an experience, um, you're not excited to say you bought something from that store on that day. No, 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 no. Anyway. Okay. I, I feel like it's going to be around, but it's going to be more focused on convenience, I think. Okay, interesting. Um, so we got, a, we got a couple of questions uh, ahead of time, and one of them um, I found very interesting because I've seen this too. How will brands adapt promotional strategies going forward? I notice a lot of brands that rarely do sales running frequent, frequent flash sales recently. You cannot open... Instagram without some, at least for me, without some high-end brand offering 50 to 70%. Now, this has always been a, an issue and nobody wants to get into it. I know I, know I read it in, in the articles. They say, oh, we don't do, do like they do discounting. They do discounting. And like a lot of these brands have to be sitting on tons of inventory that they have to move. And are you seeing a lot more of a shift to this promotional and just being like, hey, we just got to do it. We got to move this stuff. I mean, they're doing it, but they're not like being upfront. Like we're having a sale. It's maybe our first sale or get it now, whatever. The fact of the matter is they're, they're putting some fancy lingo around it. They're maybe they're moving it to a different site that's not even on their site and they're calling it an outlet. But like they're, they've got a bunch. Yes, they're all holding sales. Um, up to 70 and 80 percent always and uh, so <laughs> at all times they're sitting on spring summer merchandise that because of those retailer many of them because the retailers canceled 90 percent of orders or something bananas so yes they're all having sales there's no like getting around it now and they're all saying somebody said um if you can't Alejandra, what's her name? Anyway, I say her name wrong. The fact of the matter is somebody that is now selling on Amazon, a, a high fashion designer, uh, was like, "You, what you were judged for before, you won't be judged for now. And it's like, now, this period yeah. is the exception to the rule. Yeah. Of course she's saying that, I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of like um, expectations for like appearance during the, uh, the at-home era. It's sort of like the... <laughs> The requirements went down. Um, another question that we got was, I mean, the the holiday shopping season is critical to um, to these these companies making their year. Um, look, there was a hope um, that we were going to have this V shaped recovery. This virus is just going to wash away and stuff like this. That, that, that did not happen. And we're also looking at. Um, at schools mostly not opening or haltingly opening, and that is going to be an, a, a prolonged drag on the economy. Um, what are you seeing with this, this shifting economic outlook and shifting to bad, um, impacting shopping habits for the holiday season? Because it's a critical time. It's a critical time. That's a good question. It just reminds me of like another critical time for retail that just happened back to school that was like a bust. Like all these brands that that's a huge, their second biggest shopping period of the year, um, not seeing great numbers at all. It's just as down as it ever has been since March. Well, not since March, since May. Um, so I would say we're not, first of all, brands are not like 
preparing all that they're saying we're moving all of our spring summer merchandise we're going to what i'm hearing about for fall winter is we we're repurposing a lot of this merchandise anyway it's not going to be anything new everybody kind of comes out with launches around fall winter which is exciting and people want that i mean i don't want to say nobody but people that's the hot thing of the season and we're going to get it now and we're going to gift it um it seems like it's going to be a lot of leftover crap <laughs> I mean, people are, I mean, the big thing is, though, I mean, let's, let's talk about from the consumer. I mean, they can't, I know brands think they can just like magically create demand, but like consumers are going to have less money to spend this holiday season. That's the reality. Right. Yep. Totally. And I have a hunch some of the brands are going to become out with coming out with like more, maybe more affordable things. We've been talking about like accessories, um, the Gucci socks that were the hot seller because they were $90 and everybody's now probably, I bet the hot thing will be masks. <laughs> um, everybody, that's an entry point into the designer the designer label, um, maybe masks. Yeah, like, you know, this, this is a hot button issue with me. What is the deal with fashion brands not jumping all over, um, you know, coming out with very fashionable masks? What I don't understand about this is that everyone when this um, crisis happened, try to do all these things it's like, oh, we're gonna repurpose our factories to make hand sanitizer when it was making high-end perfume, or we're gonna like, you know, make uh, masks that can't actually be used in a, in a, in a, as PPE, but claim that it kind of is and stuff like this. There's a, a legitimate case for, I mean, look, we're in a weird time, particularly in this country, where somehow wearing a mask, which is a public health issue, has become a political issue and stuff like this. And why are fashion brands not taking a lead in making cool masks? It's bizarre. I will get tell you my take, and I will tell you what we've heard. Um, at the beginning, Literally, there was not a mask on Farfetch. There was not a mask on Netta Porte. I mean, not the very beginning, like where they had, could have had time to come out with something. And it, everybody was saying, you know, it's too touchy because masks were few and far between. Not everybody that needed a mask had a mask. And also Off-White was selling them for hundreds of dollars. And everybody's like, that's ridiculous when it's a necessity. But like, that's not a necessity. It's a fashion item. People that need it are not going to off-white. Let's be real. So. <laughs> well, I mean, if I could push back a little bit. Yes. Yes, it's a necessity. Wearing pants are a necessity too, as last I checked, at least legally. Yes. Still in Florida, it's still the law you need to wear pants. And yet people sell expensive pants. I have no issue with people selling expensive masks, just like they sell expensive pants. I mean, a mask is simply... A necessity you have to wear it just like you have to wear pants yes well they're slowly inching here just so you know ralph lauren came out with a bunch that are like next level too they've got all the anyway they've got some bells and whistles that are supposed to be better but um they're slowly going there and we just had the story on all the knockoff masks in the upper east side and the upper west side on all these fancy ladies and they're wearing a knockoff chanel mask that was never made and when we asked the brands literally they've said it's like, I mean, in, in terms of um, banishing like the counterfeiting, counterfeit products, like doing away with them. Like, what are you doing about this? And they're like, we've got too much going on right now, basically. <laughs> like, I mean, honestly, it's kind of like fighting Napster when the music labels did and then they just decided, oh, maybe we just need to legally do this because this is what people want. People need this stuff. And I don't understand why they, they can't just make a really, fine, Chanel, make a high-end mask. I, I'm good with it. That's me. All right. Final one that we got was about the future of print advertising. Um, I remember what what is the like, you know, every year Vogue used to like send out the press release about like it's like this year, Vogue is fall issue is is 1300 pages. Biggest um, issue ever. <laughs> was it, what was the highest it got? Um, look, print, print advertising, particularly uh, magazine advertising, is it's, it's a great way for, for fashion to, to quote unquote tell stories and stuff like this. I don't care what the internet people say, a banner ad can't do the job of like a big spread in vogue for Bottega Veneta or whatever. Yeah. What, where, where do you see, 
the the shifting role of, of print advertising. Yeah. We had that story on the, the Italians are coming back. Anyway, that print was picking back up after the lull um, for Vogue, for the, um, the large publications. It's, it's aspirational. If you're reading Vogue, you want to be in, I'll, I'm just concentrating on Vogue. Like you want to dream and you want to, you want an aspirational moment and you want to be looking at what's, I don't know. Yes, your dream scenario. You want to see these great ads. Brands that are not, Gucci are not waste that I would say wasting their money. They're not putting their money there because that's not reaching a large audience right now, right? Like you can reach a larger audience right now elsewhere, digital. They're they're focusing on everybody's telling me that Instagram is everything. Very few are telling me that they're they're advertising in print. Yeah. I mean, this is the overall and and I think it's going to probably be accelerated. Um in a downturn. Generally, rule of thumb in a downturn is direct response uh, advertising does way better than brand. And, yeah. you know, print and magazine advertising is true top of the funnel. Um, it's absolutely critical to, to stoking demand. But the reality is, you know, uh, this is economic downturns are when the accountants are in charge. And um, accountants love to see. Um, you know, results that you put a dollar in and then you got a dollar fifty or two dollars back. And that is Instagram. That's, you know, direct response ads always do better. Yes. And I've been seeing more Chanel on those influencers. I mean, they're going, <laughs> they're changing it up. They're not sticking in their lane in terms of advertising. Exactly. Okay, Jill, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank you. This is fun. We should do this every week. We should have just like, you know, a fashion show. We didn't even get into a personal fashion. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, Jill, thank you. Um, and thank you all for, um, for joining us this week. Uh, this is a little special edition. Um, and we're gonna have a couple more coming up and we're gonna, we're gonna focus on, um, on other industries. We're still nailing down uh, the next one. It's, it's August, lots of people are out. Um, but thank you so much for spending the last 52 minutes with us. Appreciate it. See you next week. <laughs>